السلام عليكم. السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته. عليكم السلام. سامعني يا بندر الله يحفظك. ايه هلا ننتظرك دكتور. آه نقدر نبدا. دكتور Assalamu alaikum. Uh, any one of the speakers uh, have any issue so we can start? Can you hear me, Dr. Bender? Yes. Yeah, so, yes, so I think we can, we can start with the Allah Ta'ala. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, today we are going to talk about the Allah Ta'ala. Thanks uh, for our uh, speaker. And for the audience, uh, we need to, uh, we want to announce this is the first event of our joint preservation program. Uh, we talk about the correlation between the sports surgeon and the MSK radiologist. Um, this is a webinar is accredited with the Saudi Orthopedic Association sport chapter. So I would like to thank Dr. Faya Asiri is the, for uh, his effort for that. And this webinar is a uh, course streaming. Uh, with the Ortho TV Global, which uh, help us reach the audience in India and is, uh, Asia Pacific region. So I would like uh, to thank Dr. Ashok uh, Shyam for uh, his effort. Uh, and uh, I want to thank all our speakers. Um, we are from Riyadh Central Region and from the North and from South Province. And uh, for the time, uh, we, we plan to do another webinar for the sports radiology uh, with our colleagues in the Essen province and uh, West uh, for the next time. So uh, our joint preservation program, it's uh, started newly in our university and especially in uh, King Abdullah Abdelaziz University Hospital. It's aimed to uh, match all the uh, who's interesting in about the joint preservation sports surgeons and uh, non orthoplastic surgeon as well to preserve the uh, a joint. Maybe we, most of us, sharing the same interests have sport and arthroplasty. So I give the talk, Dr. Mad. He's the initiative and the chairman of our program, Dr. Uh, Dr. Mad. Assalamu alaikum. Assalam. Ashkurak, Dr. Bandar, ala hadi al-badi al-tayyiba. Allah yahfadak ya Rab. Dr. Bandar has joined us uh, in the last two weeks only. And mashallah, tabarak al-Rahman, huduru fa'al wa kan. واضح جدا وهذه احدى البوادر الطيبه اللي احنا uh, we really appreciate it and we would love to have him with us in our team. Uh, the joint preservation program is something that it's a dream that has to come true. I think it's coming true right now by this first webinar with Allah Ta'ala. I would like to thank him for this initiation. I would like to thank all our team from the Eastern province, from the Central province, and from all over the kingdom, and our colleagues from radiology uh, for participating with us in this meeting. I do apologize for the delay because I was in the OR, but hopefully, inshallah ta'ala, things are going to go fine and great, and we can start our meeting proudly, Dr. Bandar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Maad. Uh, I would have a special uh, thanks to Dr. Uh, Mohammed Jasim Salman, is uh, my mentor during my residency, take this uh, radiology rotation. He's the man who gave me a good uh, relation that uh, mentorship is not only about teaching, it's communication and keeps this chain for improving the uh, education purpose. So for the audience, uh, you can freely use the chat. Uh, if you have any question, you can mention the speaker that you'd like to ask. And uh, uh, Dr. Mad, uh, you're going to moderate the discussion. 
for us and Abrar, can you help us to, uh, if you have any question that we uh, miss, you can stop us any time to answer these questions. So I will start uh, our uh, group, me and Dr. Mohammed uh, Jasim Salman, he's Assistant Professor King Saud Ben Abdelaziz University for Health Science, Head uh, Section of Musculoskeletal Imaging at King, uh, Medical, uh, King Abdelaziz Medical City. So first case, uh, I, we, uh, we have a patient presented to our clinic with the right knee pain with the severe uh, swelling after after history uh, of a uh, uh, fall while soccer game. Uh, patient described his injury as virus impaction injury, not uh, classic vivid or clear pivoting. Uh, patient present two weeks uh, ago after the injury. According to the patient, he was uh, fast running and he was playing the, the game in um, and an uneven spare surface like a sand, then he uh, directly fell on his, uh, his right side. So patient presented the emergency because very severe diffuse and he did the primary uh, assessment x-ray and there was a concern about this. Uh, you can see this uh, flick of bone and you think this may be uh, a line of a tibia plateau fracture. Actually, this uh, injury is not that high injury, but I, I can describe. We will see with the how severe his uh, image presented the MRI. That uh, we know Shasker uh, uh, classification TB plateau type four with medial. It's going a high risk of uh, knee dislocation or multi legs. This uh, low energy, is, it's not that much severe to uh, the force uh, affecting the TB plateau and make a bone uh, involvement uh, to the injury. So clinical examination, you come to my clinic, skin was intact, patient have severe effusion with tenderness, limited range of motion to the pain. There's a clear uh, ACL laxity, the anterior drawer and Lachman and uh, uh, Bevitt test. Patient have uh, virus stress significantly plus three, that is no end point. Uh, uh, posterior lateral colon, it was uh, questionable. Dial test was positive with the 30 degree of flexion. Uh, circulate ligament is questionable because patient have 90 query, but in uh, 30 degree was clear. There is uh, a numbness in the lateral aspect of his leg and foot, but uh, motor function was intact. Actually, we have a video. This is uh, examination and anesthesia. We can share the clinical finding. Now we assess the collateral, the MCL is intact. Fosters for the LCL. You can see obvious here there's a laxity and extension. Thank you. Now we assess the collateral. This is another uh, video. And for posterolateral, we use the fair rotation. See, draw is stable and a neutral is stable, it's not PCL, but an external rotation of the leg. You can see this. So in, uh, in this case, that uh, multi-legs injury that need uh, clear uh, imaging and, uh, and to be picky in this, uh, taking the history and examination uh, for planning the surgery, uh, I can uh, stop sharing, give Dr. Uh, 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 Abu Jassim, chance to uh, describe more about the imaging. Dr. Mohammed, Dr. Salman. Assalamu alaikum. Salam. Thanks, Dr. Bender, for uh, organizing such a great meeting. We have been waiting for uh, this for a long time. Uh, it's great to have this uh, opportunity to have correlation between the radiology and uh, orthopedic. We always eager to hear back from our colleague the feedback of our reports. And on the other hand, it will be great to sometime even see our or, or look for our challenges during the images. On the other hand, we wanna hear from the surgeon the challenges that they need to be addressed uh, through the MRI. So the images I do have actually, they were a, a WhatsApp video uh, sent by Dr. Bender during uh, his work. So unfortunately we don't have
have uh, images. And the worst usually things to give radiologists sometimes to give videos because they don't have this cross-reference and correlation. But I think in this case, uh, it is uh, uh, adequate and uh, it's very informative. So we'll start the first one. I will run the video and then we'll go through the images. You can see here the medial side and we are moving toward the central aspect. And here is the cruciate ligament and we are coming to uh, the lateral aspect. So as you see here, we just move this. Here is the lateral aspect. You can clearly here see from the lateral aspect there is significant anterior translation of the tibia in relation to the distal femur. So uh, that's clear. The menisci are intact. The anterior cruciate ligament is torn. However, there is a significant edema noted at the posterior lateral aspect. So we need to clarify it more with the other uh, Uh, plane. So I'm just going to move to the other plane. So this is the coronal of the right knee. Again, there are lots of bony browsing in the medial femoral condyle and the medial tibia. When we come to the lateral aspect here, it's clearly there is a bulging of the distal lateral, lateral ligament from the fibular attachment. There is approximately gap of uh, 1.5 centimeter, and there is buckling of the proximal aspect of the lateral, lateral ligament. In addition, if we come more posteriorly, there is a complete tear of the or a bulging of the biceps tendon from the fibular attachment as well. You don't see, usually you see the conjoint uh, insertion in the fibular head. Both of them, we, we lost them in, in here. Uh, in addition, there is significant edema within the myotendinous junction of the bobliteus tendon, here in the myotendinous junction. However, the bobliteus tendon is still attaching normally in the hiatus here. You can see here there is lots of edema and discontinuity at the region of the bobliteofibular ligament. We're supposed to see a ligament here. Sometimes you can see it nicely, but the presence of fluid in this region indicate there is complete tear of this ligament. As we're coming here posterior to the lateral tibia, there is lots of fluid that's separating the uh, capsule from the uh, lateral tibial plateau, which indicate capsular injury as well. So all these findings are in keeping with severe injury of the posterior lateral corner of the knee involving the distal lateral lateral ligament, biceps tendon with myotendinous junction injury, high grade injury of the bobliteus, as well as the capsule and the bobliteofibular uh, ligaments, in addition to the anterior cruciate ligament. You can see here the medial collateral ligament is completely intact. The posterior collateral, uh, the posterior cruciate ligament is intact as well. I'm just going to share the last one, the axial images as well. And here's the axial images. You can see the presence of joint fusion. If, you if we follow the collateral ligament, the lateral and the bobliteal and the fibular, uh, sorry, and the biceps femoris, you can see here there is disruption of both the lateral collateral ligament and biceps femoris from the proximal fibula, indicate complete tear. There are lots of fluid at the uh, posterior at the region of the posterior capsule, indicating a high grade posterior lateral corner injury. <laughs> Uh, and I think we zoom into the image. Okay. okay. So I'm going to go back to the coronal just to show it, and I'm going to wait for Dr. Bender questions about uh, more questions in the MRI. 
Yes, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Salmani gave me a very informative uh, report, but uh, this, uh, for me, as uh, this uh, young, uh, young, uh, young, uh, young patient, like 17 years old, is with the, this severe injuries, I'm sure this affecting uh, his, uh, his knee function. So I want to take the chance, if there is any uh, chance to do acute repair for better outcome and give him a next uh, for revision if this if needed in the future to give him another possibility to do reconstruction. I'm talking about posterior right for ACL. I know that we'll go for uh, ACL reconstruction. And he gave me informative report about the PCL. I was questionable for me. Posterior corner to to do a uh, uh, anatomical. Um, a reconstruction two holes with a third hole for the ACL is very uh, too invasive for this uh, just uh, 17 years old young patient. So he gave me a hint that Bobbleteus uh, tendon is uh, not a valve and uh, it's muscular tendinous. We know with the 17 years old with muscular uh, tendinous attachment that could be give me a good uh, I can trust it for a healing. But the question that I was need, I discussed in details with Dr. Salman that what about the LCL uh, avulsion and how much the stem that I uh, think it's uh, intact. So I can plan for the graft if it can need to acute repair with the anchor or passing through the bone, or I need to harvest a graft for it for reconstruction. I'm trying my best to do acute repair as much as I can for any ligament because I believe this young uh, patient uh, deserve uh, uh, repair and uh, there's a high uh, rate of uh, healing. And again, there's no one right answer. I know I discussed with the, my uh, seniors, a sports surgeon, and everyone have his own uh, opinion. And even my dictation as a medical legal, I mentioned that this case was discussed with multiple surgeon uh, seniors uh, to me uh, for the, to figure out the proper plan for the patient. And Dr. Jas, uh, Dr. Uh, Salman, uh, he helped me. How many do you think this is some of the LCL? It's uh, uh, a valve or how much a valve of the uh, uh, remin the stem, the remnant of the LCL uh, from the fibula and how much retracted and the lateral cap so that I believe it's uh, uh, an acute repair. It's uh, a good tissue or good structure for uh, lateral aspect, what's the lateral stability? Uh, you can answer that. So here is the lateral collateral ligament. You can see the buckling here, and this is the distal stump of the lateral collateral ligament, which is evolved from the fibular head. So we, we do have still a quite a good amount of the volume of the ligament. However, it is retracted by approximately 1 to 1.2 centimeter. We have to have a roller here to measure it. But the ligament itself, the bulk of the ligament is still, you can see a good element of the ligament is still intact. So I'm assuming if you can put it back here, it might work. Thank you. Uh, I need to share now the interoperative. You, you, do you want to add anything, Dr. Salman? I know that that's it. Thanks. Okay, allow me to share. Uh, so now, uh, interoperative. Uh, usually, I like to put the board the, what my plans were right knee ACL, posterolateral corner, plus minus posterolateral uh, ligament. And uh, we have to check the meniscus because it's virus impaction is still concerned about the medial aspect. Uh, I did usually uh, examination under anesthesia, and I was planning to do arthroscopy before harvesting because I wasn't sure about the uh, PCL and the posterolateral. And I was planning to do a harvesting the graft, hamstring, plus minus PTB if I have need to do a uh, postulator reconstruction. I like to use BTB for the ACL and hamstring. I can pass it for anatomical. Uh, arthroscopy, I start with arthroscopy uh, ACL, passing the, make the tunnel, passing the graft, then open uh, procedure for the postulator corner and try to fix the acute repair for the capsule and uh, bicep femoris and LCL and uh, the sequence of uh, fixation. This is uh, my landmark, I land, like the for DTB and the hamstring, and this is the incision, uh, hockey stick incision for the posterolateral cone. Here the we can see the image for arthroscopy now, the video. Okay. Now we see this is the ACL. This is the ACL stump now near the tibial side. Femoral side, we can see it's still attached, the posterolateral is here laxed, is attached and healed, partial heat over the PCL. And completely anteromedial side is torn. Thank you. Okay. Now we. 
And this is another video with, <clears throat> about the uh, posterior crochet ligament because it's affect our plan for graft uh, planning. So here is attached to the femur. It looks strange, but still attached well and will cover that. I can feel it's very stable. Thank you. Uh, the uh, compartment, and we know this is the distraction side, and this is the sign of drive through sign. See the bulb, we have five millimeter and five millimeters, so we have complete like one centimeter more than this is five, five, we can see like more than 10 milliliter gap. And here we can see about the lateral capsule from where the meniscus, because we know some, it's, it's pure in the medial side because the medial, we know the medial meniscus. It's uh, attached more to the capsule, but still we can assess the capsule from where detached the bend to the meniscus. So we see the meniscus now is floating from the tibia. That gives me a sign that the capsule it's already torn from the tibial side, not from the femoral side. And now we want to see assess the probabilities if it's tension or no. See, I put the probe and pull it. So when I pull, I feel there's a tension. That means the probabilities is intact. So we have a capsule. Muscle tendon is uh, torn in the popliteus and the LCL complete rupture. So does it give us a hint how we can manage this postural complex? Thank you. Battle compart compartment. And we know this is the... Sorry. This is uh, see how it assists the uh, popliteus. Okay, we are now in the last one. Get up to go to assist the popliteus and the postural complex. We know the patient had a so you can see the gap now open, but this is can help us that the poverty is still there, it's clear and tight here in the female, as the MRI finds. Thank you. And here I assess the compression side, the medial compartment. Mm -hmm. Okay, now this is virus infection, so we're expecting that the injury will be in the medial compartment, the cartilage meniscus. So we start the root intact and here the body anterior horn and we'll go and see the round region round it's no round region because it's not as we expected this is not a pivot injury a pivot injury acl will be pure with the round region and this is this in this situation we don't see any round region because this virus Induction with medium injury, medium, uh, yeah, not high energy trauma, it's medium energy trauma. Ramp region is completely intact, attached to the capsule. Thank you. And uh, we remember we mentioned the x ray. This is this flick bone that we think uh, fracture. Uh, here in the arthroscopic, we find it's a small uh, cut, uh, part of the uh, articular surface from uh, medial femoral condyle. Where's the MRI showing the bruising? It's uh, floating and go through the capsule and uh, medial uh, and uh, stop in the uh, medial uh, side of the medial tibial toe. You can see it here. The, now we're looking for a cartilage damage because this we know is a virus infection. This is the compression side. It's affecting here, and this is the control defect. It's extra take a non-weight bearing. So it's non-weight bearing area. So I don't think that we need to do a lot with this. And very small. Thank you. Okay, now. So after arthroscopic, I start, uh, we did the ACL. I don't need to mention that. Uh, not in, this is not about technique. Just to share the image. This is the hockey stick. This is the IT band. Uh, we open it. We ex I think we need to explore the perineal nerve and do neurolysis could help to improve his uh, sensory. I'm not sure that if no motor uh, dysfunction or uh, uh, motor is intact, you need to play with the, if some and uh, danger uh, structure like perineal nerve. But I think why not? It's an, my way. I have to release it. Just do neurolysis. Uh, here are the videos. Open the approach for posterior lateral. This is the biceps. We lift the biceps and we explore the peroneal nerve. You can see here is contused because of the injury, but still it is intact, no through a cross cut in the nerve. Actually, patient uh, pre op is uh, peroneal, peroneal nerve is intact, but have some numbness uh, over the area of the foot, lateral side. This is because of the contusion of the nerve. Thank you. We they, we assess the position through the scope. It was uh, tight and double check here. We assess through the open approach. We can see the position, the lay back is still tight. 
Thank you. As you can see now here, the PCL is intact, which is tender intact. I have LCL, just I wait for the LCL. It's really like MRI finding. It's uh, a valve and the stem is enough to acute repair or I need to do reconstruction. And this affect my uh, graft planning. Open the approach for posterolateral. So, this is... So here. And this is the most important that we talk about the capsule. We can find the capsule is already attached completely from the tibial side and the fibular side. This is the most important, I think, it's affect the, uh, the stability of the lateral side. Uh, we'll try to repair the, acutely repair the uh, capsule of the lateral uh, uh, knee. Thank you. So I, I believe concept during my uh, fellowship with the trauma center like Sunnybrook in Toronto, I, we face a lot. Acute repair for the capsule is very effective. And I believe, uh, believe me, when we I start to repair the capsule because it's the most uh, deep structure uh, uh, in this approach, I find it uh, make, give me more resistant with virus stress, but sure, I, I finish up everything. So in acute phase, a capsule, it's a good structure, but sometimes in chronic, it's become flimsy, especially if migrate more from the attachment. This is the other video for the LCL. This is now the, uh, we isolate or explore the LCL ligament is to uh, attach to the femoral side footprint and uh, detach or turn from the uh, f uh, f uh, fibular head. This is the biceps femoris attached in the front of the fibular head. We we will get attach it here to repair with the antenna brace. Thank you. So actually, as he said, the stem is good enough, but I find when I try to fix it and retain it to the uh, fibrillar head, with the repair, we need some uh, tenodesis. You need some five millimeter to be free to do it. If you use knotless, if you use knotted, that you need the stem to go inside. Uh, and that, uh, and it wasn't enough, so I tried to take five millimeter from the, our hamstring graft that I used for the ACL, and it was very, more, more than enough to give me this uh, option for the acute repair. This graft, it was evolved from the fibril head, and with the full extension, it's very tight. You cannot repair it in this high uh, tension. So we augmented with the part of the CMT graft. With, uh, we split it two pieces and put the ACL inside, and we make it like a jacket, and we're going to insert it in the fibrillar head. Thank you. And this is the most important that we talk it's about graph. the capsule. We can Just find out the graph. Graph. Sorry. I have to go again. So I can see now this patient after a, a six weeks post-op, standing stray we know i know now because before usually our patient come to our clinic for joint preservation we have specific uh, images we maybe we'll discuss it later uh, about how we uh, how our protocol for uh, any patient came with a joint uh, issue i couldn't make it for this patient because multi legs you cannot stand after six weeks patient can stand you can see now the alignment here is i know this is not proper but it's still attached normally and found this patient have significant virus that when he, he, he fell that his knee going in virus. Now we go to the second case. Uh, I hope this case will be faster. I know take uh, more time. The 16 years old uh, male presented to the, uh, our clinic with right knee and uh, stability with clinic uh, uh, clicking during range of motion, flexion extension. After history of twisting injury with hyperflexion, not exactly pivot. Patient said I was... Uh, Hyperflex tried to go down and they feel a click and he didn't feel any pivot and fall down and the swelling, it wasn't that much. But patient is still, I have instability, giving away. Patient present to us after two months. Clinical examination skin was intact. There's moderate fusion with tenderness laterally for range of motion with clear clicking. And you can see some, uh, 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 you know, see some like bucket handed because patient is very young and skinny, you can see the meniscus going out. And we know this is very uh, famous uh, sign of the uh, uh, ter uh, torn discoid uh, meniscus. Uh, clinical and assessing ACL, there is some laxity. Patient is 16 years and you have some laxity, but it's not suggestive. And you draw plus two, Lachman, it was that this end point, but we know with, uh, with meniscus injury, bucket handle or severe uh, or uh, massive tear that you can, it's uh, sensitivity of Lachman test will be decreased because sometimes you feel the end point of the uh, 
the incarcerated, the meniscus inside the joint. Bivet test, who's give me rule that the ACL looks intact because just it's just uh, gliding. It's not even uh, uh, bivoting. There's no sign of other structural injury or for the collaterals or other uh, structures inside the from the examination. This remarks was intact. This is the patient. You can see here flattening of the lateral femoral condyle, the sign of the discoid meniscus. And as I say, this our uh, images. We re we request AB was uh, was being friction AB and skyline lateral for slope and long film. This is the patient have virus. So this is giving me a hint. If I go there and have meniscus, I need to take some meniscus. Patient already in virus that would not give patient more harm. Take some of the meniscus for uh, cesarization. So I need the MRI. My question that. What should I do? Because the patient is 16 years old and have instability with query, ACL is intact. Now my main concern, discuss with the family, with the patient that I'm going for ACL with meniscus and the surgeon, we know that if you have meniscus tear and you want to repair it, the high chance of healing will be much, much better if you, if you do the ACL because you stabilize the knee and the bleeding from tunneling to help the healing. But and our step in the OR, usually if you are sure this ACL, if you have exam the MRI, you go direct. And I will disappoint after the MRI. Dr. Uh, Salman, if you can share and the images, please. Dr. Salman. Dr. Salman, you are yeah. in the mute. Yeah, yeah so. Okay, so we have again a similar thing, a video of this patient. I will just run it and then we'll comment. I'll just stop here. Uh, you can see there is abnormal signal. This is the medial side. There is abnormal signal within the meniscus, however, medial meniscus, however, it's not reaching to the either articular surface. If we come to the lateral mm -hmm. side, you can see there is a folded meniscus. So we have a large bucket handle of the lateral meniscus with displaced fragment anteriorly and centrally. And if we look uh, to the volume of the meniscus itself, I think in the coronal images. You can see the volume of the meniscus itself is very large. So that's indicate actually to start with, there was a, a discoid meniscus, which is uh, had a large uh, bucket handle tear with displaced fragments centrally and uh, within the intercondylar notch. Regarding the other questions that uh, Dr. Bender mentioned about the ACL, you can see here the ACL is not completely normal and it's very tough to judge if it's complete or not. And I think at that time I asked Dr. Bender to send me another image, which was the axial, just to help me more deciding whether it is uh, completely torn or there is only strain. And in this, in this image, I think the most important thing to have another look to the ACL and the axial images. You always have to have a backup uh, sequ sequences to look to the ACL other than the sagittal. So here, if we follow the anterior crochet ligament, this is the femoral attachment. You could still see it. You can see there is abnormal signal at the mid aspect, but you can still follow it down to the tibial attachment. So I think there is a mild to moderate sprain of the ligament. However, it is still intact. So uh, we have a large uh, bucket handle discoid meniscus with a partial sprain of the anterior cruciate ligament. Uh, I'll just share one thing before we go, Dr. Bender, to the uh, always uh, try to have alternative uh, sequences for the ACL. I usually do... Uh, Oblique sometime if I am in uh, trouble. So this is, I'm just going to show you how we do the oblique. This is an example of a patient. 
this is how radiologists look uh, like to look to the images. They want to, the whole thing with uh, cross reference. Anyway, so how to do the oblique coronal oblique? You basically uh, we tell our technologists to plan their ACL according to the Blumenstein line. So in this way, you will get the ACL all in one profile. This will give you more confidence about the uh, ACL. Is it torn or not? And even if it's torn, how much of this ligament is torn? This is an example of an intact uh, ligament. I will show you an example of a torn ligament quickly. You can see the ligament here. Sorry, this is another intact ligament. Again, you can see the ligament over here. I'm just going to show you another. Again, if you put the anterior crochet ligament in profile, you can see here there is complete tear of the proximal aspect of the anterior crochet ligament. Okay, uh, back to you, Bender. Uh, yeah, uh, this is a good uh, point. I learned that there's some technique you can do, especially uh, specifically if you want to assess the ACL. If you have a clear question or questionable about the, your assessment or examination, you ask for this technique or contact with your radiologist. Uh, this is a learn from this uh, point. And uh, I go back to share the interoperative. So interoperative, this is the ACL was in, looks intact. Intraoperatively, nicely, anatomical position. I am holding the posterior lateral, the intermedial, and here. And this is the lateral discoid uh, meniscus. You can see the tear from the interior part of the body to the mid, and you can re tear reaching the posterior aspect, posterior aspect of the meniscus. And uh, thank you. Uh, I want to answer. Uh, I want to ask question for my colleagues, uh, the surgeons. Uh, I, when you find the patient have ACL, we're not talking about this case specifically. Patient have injury or pivoting injury come with the, uh, uh, laxity, but without any instability. He come to you with pain and you find the MRI, there's meniscus tear there that indicated for surgical intervention, like radial tear, bucket handle, but he has no instability. And you, when you do a clinical examination, there's some laxity. So what's the plan to do ACL reconstruction with meniscus repair to... Uh, and, and increase the chance of uh, healing of the meniscus or just go if you find this partial tear because that you didn't have, patient have no instability and uh, complaining, but it uh, likes to come from partially and you just do the meniscus. Dr. Faya, what's uh, your uh, clinical uh, judgment or plan? What do you tell your patient in this scenario? Thank you for inviting for this meeting. Uh, I'll answer you for this question. For me, the patient is stable clinically. Uh, at least some laxity grade one I can accept, uh, especially if the ACL uh, during arthroscopy it's intact. If I am seeing it's in intact or sprained or uh, um, I'm checking both bundles for the ACL, uh, if it is intact, I'll not do anything for, for the ACL. I'll proceed with the meniscus only. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Nad, as senior, what do you think? According to what I see, uh, first of all, okay, um, the ACL, if it's not bothering him and the patient is not complaining of any instability in the knee, I will go with the meniscus first of all. I have to manage it properly, uh, deal with it first of all, and uh, give him a good range of motion and test his knee after that. If he still complain of it, I will go back again. Thank you very much. And this scenario for our radiologist, I, it, it's affecting our uh, plan and surgery. If you I have a question about instability, this case is different. Patient have instability, but it was not because not 90% of instability, it's come from the ACL, but there's still some causes for instability like bucket handle, meniscus tear. And in this case, usually if we have uh, MRI finding shows this uh, ACL tone and clinical examination and uh, examination the is showing this, we go direct to harvest the graph during the preparation for the scope and uh, but in this case uh, if you have questionable we do scope first but with Dr. 
Salman, which I trust, he go, he tell me this ACL looks intact and usual. And he tell me we talk about is any sign of pivoting like ramp lesion. And, uh, he tell me there's no ramp lesion, there's no uh, any uh, spine in the MRI, there's any pivoting injury. So I go direct with the scope without any harvesting, and uh, it was reassuring. And the finding was matching with the uh, MRI finding was matching with the uh, intraoperative finding. Thank you, everyone. I will stop uh, sharing. And uh, I want to answer so, wh one of the questions has come to me about the capsule. I repaired the capsule uh, with the anchor, uh, uh, knotted anchor uh, through uh, over the TV plateau, just uh, like one centimeter or half uh, uh, five millimeter underneath the articular surface. And with the anchor and give the stability in uh, uh, a 20 degree of uh, valgus, uh, uh, valgus stress. Uh, now uh, I want to invite this uh, second uh, group, uh, Dr. Mamdouh uh, Al-Malki, uh, consultant MSK, radio, MSK Imaging and Intervention Radiologist at King Saud University Hospital, and Dr. Sagar Rueli, consultant orthopedic orthoplasty sports medicine, College of uh, Medicine, Jove University, is as uh, assistant uh, professor there. Uh, please uh, start. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bender, for uh, inviting us for this uh, amazing uh, meeting. Um, uh, actually, this our case today is, uh, is uh, a quick case. It's uh, very interesting. Um, uh, inshallah, we'll start uh, sharing the screen with Dr. Uh, Dr. Mamdouh Al-Malik, inshallah. Hey, Mac. Uh, you will share the screen, inshallah. Next. So uh, this is a patient. He's a bodybuilder. He's 28 years old, patient, uh, right uh, hand dominant. He's a professional uh, weightlifter. So this is the uh, mechanism of injury that happened to him. He came to my clinic with the, uh, complaining of shoulder pain. So he was doing um, uh, inclining uh, um, dumbbell exercise. So uh, this is the mechanism of injury. The good thing that he brought his uh, his uh, uh, fidi with him during the clinic. If you can concentrate here, he's um, while uh, uh, on deceleration, he was complaining of sharp, severe pain, and then the numbers was dropped. So the first thing that came on my mind during this uh, um, uh, video that he might have, um, my concern was jump and examine pectoralis major uh, tendon. So next. So a uh, patient came with uh, an arm sling. Um, um, his passive range of motion was uh, okay. Um, uh, he, he doesn't have any ligament laxity. Usually for shoulder cases, I like to start with uh, specific tests, especially I'll start with rotators, then the, the, the labrum uh, special test. So during examination, the, uh, the range of motion was okay in all, in all motions. The um, the uh, when I start examining his um, uh, uh, labrum, concentrating on um, start. I usually start with operant test. Operant test was um, once I start operant test, his shoulder was subluxed posterior in the clinic. So um, I directly reduce the, the the head back. So I stop um, uh, the examination. Uh, we requested the MRI. Uh, X-ray normal. Next. So this, this is the sequence of uh, MRI. Uh, Dr. Mamdouh, if you can uh, start, please. Assalamu alaikum, Jamia. Uh, thank you all for this uh, meeting and for the organizer and speakers. And uh, I think it's a good, st uh, good um, start. And thank you also for attendees for their attendance. Um, Okay, the, the x-ray was normal. There is no fracture or dislocation. And we are, uh, I will turn on the videos, scroll and axial for uh, fluid sensitive sequences, usually routinely. We request for uh, shoulder uh, joint uh, routine sequence, um, fluid sensitive sequences with uh, T1.
So we can see here uh, the from the coronal images, we uh, there is uh, soft tissue edema involving the teres minor, an inferior uh, aspect of the infraspinatus extending to the uh, um, insertion to the uh, humeral head. And uh, we uh, see also here likely a laxity of the posterior inferior capsule. And I'm concerning about uh, any also posterior and uh, posterior capsule uh, or posterior band of inferior glial humeral ligament also injury. Uh, if you go more uh, anteriorly, we uh, can see the uh, anchor and biceps tendon are preserved and other rotator cuff tendons are also preserved. So from the axial, we can uh, start to see um, a linear high signal intensity at the uh, posterior labrum. Extending more inferiorly and posteriorly till uh, 6 p.m. Okay. And also, as uh, I mentioned before, we can uh, see the laxity of posterior capsule and adjacent soft tissue edema. And also the uh, small pony bruises seen anterior uh, of the humerus. So my findings goes with posterior dislocation, relocation, or uh, posterior subluxation of the shoulder joint. Uh, I select um, uh, a few images uh, that shows that edema involving the uh, teres minor here. And uh, also I correlate with uh, T1 signals. Uh, the teres minor also has high signal intensity on T1 uh, that indicate, uh, may under indicate underlying um, uh, denervation of the teres minor too. This could be due to um, trauma if it's acute or subacute, or if it's a subacute or patient uh, known to have uh, known as athletic patient and um, overhead activity. So that may play a role to uh, cause some um, denervation of teres minor. <clears throat> However, the quadrilateral space looks okay here. And uh, the posterior uh, inferior capsule shows a laxity, as I mentioned before. So I have also concern about the posterior band of inferior inferior uh, posterior band of inferior glenohumeral ligament injury with the posterior capsule and uh, labral tear uh, extending from the uh, uh, eleven p.m. till six p.m. This is selected images for it. And again, noted the uh, edema scene uh, involving the teres minor and fetal fiber of the uh, uh, infraspinatus, uh, also posterior fiber of the deltoid. So uh, this is a quick review uh, indication for MRI for instability. Usually we want MRI to assist the static stabilizer and dynamic stabilizer. Static stabilizer, uh, including the osseous structure, I'm talking about the glenoid and the humeral head as well as the labrum and um, a capsule uh, and uh, glenohumeral ligaments, uh, superior glenohumeral ligament, uh, middle glenohumeral ligament, inferior anterior and posterior band. And also dynamic stabilizer for rotator cuff tendons and longitudinal biceps. So for this case, uh, morphology of the articular surface, especially of glenoid, looks okay. There is no sign of um, glenoid dysplasia or any fracture. Um, just it's soft tissue injury. It's not osseous reverse pancart lesion. Um, uh, usually, uh, with such, with glenoid dysplasia, you, we can see the early stage, just um, uh, rounded posterior glenoid, but more advanced, it's, it's, which is 
uh, sometimes under diagnosis and may uh, play a role in uh, in recurrent subluxation and uh, uh, this is advanced stage which is not this is not our case advanced stage of or advanced uh, grade of uh, glenoid uh, hypoplasia we we can see the uh, labrum hypertrophy and uh, posterior glenoid defects and uh, usually i'm trying to take uh, depth and length and percent of the hill sac or reverse hill sac and usually hill sac fracture which is uh, give the surgeon uh, good uh, quantitative measurement for uh, surgical planning. So um, labrum is low signal and it's fiber cartilaginous structure. So it's very low signal intensity on all sequences. Any high signal intensity seen within the labrum suggests of uh, injury. However, we have a normal variant, normal structure, normal foramina seen uh, in the superior uh, aspect of the labrum so be careful to call it as a uh, tear anyway uh, the message is uh, labrum is low signal intensity and prefer to, to see it on uh, an uh, um, three tesla or uh, mri arthrogram especially if it's a uh, um, low stage like birthies or yani it's not a detached uh, labrum injury so again arthrogram versus non arthrogram for our case, uh, no, no need for arthrogram because it's acute stage and uh, our acute injury. And uh, we can delineate the uh, findings from adjacent uh, contrast from the joint fusion and soft tissue edema for more chronic. And uh, if it's not uh, first, you know, if it's more chronic and we patient had recurrent dislocation and uh, it was equivocal or uh, normal on previous MRI shoulder, we can proceed for arthrogram to uh, trying to find the uh, underlying uh, labrum uh, tear and distension of the joint to see the capsule and uh, glenohumeral ligaments and type of the capsular uh, insertion. As we know, uh, type 3 uh, sometimes, which is may play a role in uh, shoulder dislocation, especially anterior shoulder dislocation if it inserted uh, more distal from the glenoid, 1.5 centimeter. So um, uh, in summary, um, not um, arth uh, uh, in summary, non arthrogram uh, first, uh, if it's solve your question, it's good if not uh, ask for arthrogram. We'll go back to the interoperative uh, findings with Dr. Sager. So uh, as a summary, thank you, Dr. Mandur, for this uh, uh, sharing your, your uh, info. So th he's a 28 years old, young body lifter, first time uh, injury to his shoulder. So um, um, we can go conservative versus, op versus operative. But once I saw the patient in the clinic, his shoulder was subluxing on my hands while I'm doing not only, it's not a, a stress test to the posterior labrum, it's an Aubrian test, which is internal rotation and abduction to the to the shoulder, and his shoulder uh, going back. So um, I discussed with the patient, uh, operative, non-operative, and cho he chose operative uh, management for quick rehab and quick uh, uh, recovery. Um, uh, I don't have the video, sorry, I was uh, taking video uh, from the uh, iPad that uh, downloaded in the tower, but I couldn't extract it from the system. So um, uh, examination, um, um, there was no slab lesion, anterior labrum was intact, rotators was intact, completely intact. My question to Dr. Mamdouh at that time, do you think that this is um, uh, a reverse Huggle lesion or not? So if you go back to, to MRI, axial cut to Dr. Mamdouh, uh, as you know, in North region, I don't have a MSK radiologist, so um, uh, unfortunately, so um, I, I usually um, read uh, um, articles and many, many, many books for radiology just to see how can I read a good MRI. So if you, if you can see the posterior the axial cut, the, the, the posterior capsule, it's, is it attached or not to the, to the, um, to the back of the uh, humerus or not? Is it reverse hagel or not? Because posterior labrum, usually they came with either slab or reverse hagel. Um, uh, this patient is acute, first time dislocation, 
uh, we can discuss the um, um, if we need a, a CT scan to, to see the uh, bony, bony issue if, in case of recurrent posterior shoulder dislocation to see the retroversion and how to manage the retroversion in the glenoid. But in this case, it's a first time dislocation, so I don't think that we need a CT scan to see the, the retroversion and see the bony, bony issue. So it's only soft tissue. So um, in MRI, the posterior band, um, uh, as Dr. Mamdouh mentioned, I think it's still attached to posterior um, uh, uh, humerus. So I don't think that there is um, a reverse huggle, but there is um, a redundancy in the posterior capsule. Um, um, also in, in sagittal view from six to um, um, two o'clock, it's, it's all, all detached. So um, my, my um, uh, um, concern was before or after, do, do I need to discuss the patient that I will go for um, a capsular application for posterior um, uh, and the result, as you know, with the capsular application for posterior, he will lose um, uh, the internal rotation. So uh, this is the question that many patients ask, especially for uh, professional athletes. Post of what's, what's the expectation? How, how can I go and when I can go back to, to sport? So uh, uh, interop, the findings was um, isolated posterior labral tear which was fixed with uh, with uh, anchors from uh, 6 o'clock till 11 o'clock. If you go, go back to the picture, uh, interrupt the Yeah. So um, uh, I put, I think, two, two to three. Um, uh, one is single loaded anchor at six at 5 o'clock, and one and four and one double, uh, double, at, uh, double loaded anchor at uh, uh, 11 o'clock. Thank you. Dr. Dr. Mundo, you want to add something? Okay, thank you. Uh, no, thank you, thank you very much. This is Dr. Sager Howes. We can imagine the sports or the uh, sports surgeon with the MSK radiologist, how the collaboration from north, the uh, Jof uh, province or Jof region and from Duh work in Riyadh Center. And um, not everyone have a time or have the effort to read a lot of uh, articles and read. Uh, so it's a challenge to work in the periphery. I agree with Dr. Sagar's uh, great job. And thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Malki for his uh, 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 Cooperation. Now we talk about the uh, third group. Uh, actually, so Dr. Fai, I would uh, start with Dr. Uh, and Dr. Al Gahtani. We start with Dr. Yasser Al Ghamdi, a musculoskeletal radiology consultant in King's Road Medical City, and Dr. Muad Al Amr, assistant professor and consultant upper extremity in sport uh, surgery at uh, uh, Imam uh, University. Uh, you can share. Start, please. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Is the uh, presentation clear? Clear. If you want to make full screen or you can run it like this. No problem. Thank you, Dr. Bender, for inviting me. I'm here with Dr. Yasser Al Ghamdi, uh, MSK consultant at, uh, at the clinic. Okay, so we have the three shoulder cases and I'm going to start uh, the first case and I'm going to talk about my experience at the more at the private uh, sectors. Sometimes we have we face issues with the reporting of the MRI findings. Uh, sometimes uh, an MSK specialist uh, reports the MRI and sometimes uh, some findings and signs are missed in the MRI. So the first case is that uh, we have, I had a patient, 50 years old male, known case of hypertension, diabetes. He presented with the left shoulder pain for the last five months. He failed non steroidal steroid injections and physio. Exam shows, showed uh, biceptal growth tenderness with AC joint tenderness. He has uh, uh, almost full range of motion. Job's test was positive. O'Brien's test for biceps and slab was positive. Hawkins' uh, test was positive. 
So my impression for this patient was a cuff tear uh, with the long head of biceps tendinitis and the slap tear. I asked for an MRI and it came back to me with a normal signal uh, void appearance of the glenoid labra. So now to the images, I have Dr. Yasser with me, so he might read the image. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Dr. Maaz and the committee for the invitation. Uh, welcome, Dr. Yasser. Nice to meet you. Uh, uh, here, the, the, some selective images for the MRI shows the, uh, the bright signals, uh, which is uh, almost clear in this non-orthogram uh, MRI. And actually, it is extending from uh, almost uh, 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 four to six uh, crook position. And it, here, you can see it's clear uh, extending through the superior labrum without, without any dis detachment or displacement. Uh, it was reported actually normal, so we have to add this in the report and explain to the surgeon. Okay, uh, back to you, Doctor. So when I found this uh, sign, and I want to make sure with uh, with the radiologist, so I went back to Dr. Ramdi as an MSK, and he confirmed with me the pathology at the uh, biceps anchor and the slap tear finding. So uh, since the patient had failed all conservative management. We elected to go for a for a shoulder scope, diagnostic scope, and possible biceps tenotomy. So this is the uh, the uh, shoulder scope here. So we are looking at the patient in a beach chair position, looking posterior uh, viewing portal, and uh, I, 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 there's a, you can see the hook and the probe from the anterior portal, and the biceps at the uh, upper side of the video. And you can see the fraying of the superior labrum with uh, the, the detachment of the biceps anchor. So uh, since the patient was 50 years old, low demand, we elected to go for biceps tenotomy. As you, as you can see, we are cutting the biceps here with a loose labrum. So we continued doing the diagnostic scope, looking for other structures. As we can see here, the insertion of the supraspinatus on the uh, greater tuberosity. We can uh, see the tendons are intact. And we went subacromial sub uh, diagnostic scope, and we did some subacromial uh, decompression and removing part of the bursa. So this is a second case, a 27 years old uh, military uh, male. He had left recurrent shoulder dislocation. The first time was eight months back with, with a sport activity. Second time was two weeks back while reaching above head with simple motion. All dislocations were reduced in the hospital at the emergency department. Exam showed full range of motion, positive apprehension test for anterior labrum with a positive and pain uh, test with a posterior load and shift test. So my impression was that the patient's having a bankart, at least a bankart tear. So I asked for an MRI and the non-MSK radiologist reported that he has no labral tear. So I talked to my uh, friend, Dr. Yasser Ghamdi, uh, and uh, he had a review on the MRI. Dr. Yasser. Yeah. Once again, uh, this is for selective images for the shoulder, left shoulder. Here you can see, although this is a low magnetic field MRI, open MRI, unfortunately the tear, it was seen involving the posterior labrum and it does extend to the, inform, the inferior one to the uh, anterior one, almost from the three to six uh, position. Uh, Okay. What do you think about the uh, superior part of the slab uh, labrum? Do you think it's intact or? Uh, yeah, from these images, it looks like uh, it looks intact. So, uh, when I have this like these images, should I request for contrast orthogram, or is the uh, tear is it's clear? Uh, 
so if, if, if the patient or if, if the examination was clear that the, or suspect for the liver, we recommend that to at least to avoid low magnetic fields or uh, you can proceed directly or recommend for the MR arthrogram. And uh, if, if it's possible to ask for uh, specialized or uh, at least one expert uh, radiologist to, to read this one. Excellent. So I took your word on this patient regarding the tear. So my plan is to go for shoulder scope with uh, and uh, a possible posterior and anterior labral repair and a possible slab repair versus tenodesis since the patient presented at a young uh, age. So as you can see here, uh, this is a uh, lateral position uh, with the uh, posterior viewing portal. As you can see here, we're stuck at the sublibral foramen and going down, you can, you can see the tear and the cartilage damage with some erosion at the anterior part of the uh, greenoid. Now we are at uh, seven and six o'clock. It's clear that the patient's having a tear from three, sorry, from nine, eight, seven, six, up to uh, the four or five o'clock. Now we're examining for a slap tear and we find that the biceps is intact with no tear of the uh, superior part of the labrum and pulling down the biceps tendon to look for any uh, or synovitis around the biceps tendon. So uh, this is another viewing por uh, another uh, uh, view from the anterior superior portal and uh, anterior superior portal in a lateral position. We can see the anterior labrum here. We are dividing the uh, anterior part of the glenoid to prepare for labral repair. Now we are at the seven o'clock, going down to six o'clock, and back at the four o'clock. So what we have done for this patient is a repair of the posterior labrum with multiple double, load, double loaded uh, anchors. So moving on to the uh, last case, the third case, uh, page, uh, 59 years old lady fell down on her arm, outstretched arm three weeks back so while she's doing Umrah. Uh, she presented with a limited range of motion, especially flexion and, uh, and uh, external rotation. On her examination, uh, she also had a positive jobs test and a pos positive appliance test with weak abduction. So my impression for this patient due to the limitation of motion is that she has a froze, frozen shoulder and a possible a cuff and a slap tear. Moving on, the, on to the MRI images, Dr. Yasser, would you comment on this uh, picture? Yeah, yeah, the selective image shows again the almost complete or complete sobrosmanitis and defrosmanitis, tendon tear with the retraction and mild diffuse edema. However, there is no significant muscular atrophic changes seen here. What about the axial cuts? Do you see any uh, subscap or infraspinatus? Yeah, so for those subscap and uh, teres minor tendons are uh, uh, intact with the parts, some of the joint effusion. And here there is no frank labral tear could be seen. Thank you so much. So moving on with the, with the diagnostic findings, interpretive findings. So this is the MRI report. Uh, there is no... The, it uh, shows that the patient has a supraspinatus and infraspinatus tear. So we elected for shoulder scope and uh, cuff uh, repair and the biceps tenotomy. So you can see here, we are viewing the patient uh, in the beach chair position from a pos posterior lateral portal since the tear is massive in involving the supra and infraspinatus. You can see here the uh, 
supra and infra tendon, conjoint tendon. We can see here that down the glenoid, interarticular and the head, and the GT on the right side. So after cleaning and depriving the sub subacromial space, we are testing the retractability of the tendon, which has good uh, retraction. After that, we put some multiple anchor, anchors, three medial anchors, and was augmented with a double row, uh, two lateral anchors. And by this, we ended our uh, cases. Thank you. Uh, great cases, Dr. Maad, Dr. Yasser. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, for, for me, especially, I want to have two questions. One question to uh, Dr. Sagar regarding this Sagar in the periphery, uh, Jove. Uh, he said, You have no muscle skeletal geologist. If you do, you have routine protocol. If you have any patient come with the labrum or instability that you have an uh, issue about the labrum, what, what's your recommendation? What do you request for the MRI? Arthrogram? Do you have someone who doing arthrogram there? So tell us about um, so in North region, in the past two years, I have never opened an, a report because uh, yeah, the thing that uh, Dr. Maad is doing now, he's in, uh, I think, a big hospital now, and they are reading um, 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 a wrong MRI. They are giving a wrong report. So I don't blame the guys that I have. So I never open an, uh, a report. One, two, the protocol, nobody knows how to do orthogram. No one. So I depend fully on myself. And reading MRI, if I have a, if I have any question, if I have a query question regarding some very small details, I might have um, assisted um, a request one of my colleagues um, uh, to read the the the, uh, the MRI. Uh, it's very difficult for me. I know in the, the, the start I was struggling a lot to to read the MRI. I need someone to give me the the thing that I can um, uh, plan with the patient because the patient need an answer. So if I have told him I need, I will go with uh, one procedure, then I add another procedure, he will never trust me. So it's very difficult for me. Then uh, I went through many um, uh, papers online teaching uh, how to read the MRI. Uh, still, I'm, I'm in the in very uh, down bottom of the of the, our guys with MSK, but at least I still have a, a very minimal experience how to be safe. If I have a question, I will go back to MSK. It's very difficult for me, to be honest. And if you allow me to uh, to add, uh, add uh, something, that in the private sectors, you know, we need some insurance approval for the surgery. If we don't get the right diagnosis and the right findings, we can't ask for implant charges. We, are, we can't ask for the anchors and the coverage of the procedures because the insurance company will, will, reply, will reply that it's only bursitis or or, or acromioplasty or debridement. Why do you need the anchors? Why do you need the implants? It's not mentioned mentioned in the reports. So sometimes we need, I mean, some documentation to help us with the uh, approval for the patient. I feel your pain, Dr. Mahat. So second question uh, for our colleague uh, radiologist. So in this condition that if I have my center, I have no facility for arthrogram and they have concern about instability or concern about, we need to have a clue about the labrum. Any help or what can be done or can, how I can make the request? Because I know if you need a clear, uh, clear answer, you have, should we have proper request? Dr. Salman, any suggestion? Uh, if you do have a three Tesla, uh, three, uh, Tesla MRI, which is a high magnetic field MRI, usually it can show you the labrum very well. So probably you can get away without doing arthrogram. So if in this case, if I'm in the private sector, for instance, and I want to do it without arthrogram, I probably look to, to the center where there is a three Tesla MRI with a special shoulder coil. It gives you a high resolution. Probably you can get away without doing arthrogram. I don't know if uh, Dr. Mamdouh or Dr. Yasser can add anything or other radiologist. Yeah, I agree with uh, Dr. Salman, uh, but unfortunately, the three Tesla is not uh, available in the private. Maybe it's available in one, in one center in Riyadh. 
uh, but uh, if you if you do have uh, a musculoskeletologist or uh, second opinion or utilizing the teleradiology, maybe it can help in future, especially if you are working part time in a rural area or something like that. Totally agree with you, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, if you have a three Tesla and uh, uh, shoulder coil, it will um, you can do it without uh, even uh, giving the arthrogram, even if it's a small labral region. Uh, this is what I think. Uh, thank you. Such an amazing discussion. Now we go with our uh, uh, fourth group, Dr. Ali al Gahtani, Diagnostic Radiology, Musculoskeletal Diagnostic and Interventional Radiology Consultant, King uh, Faisal Medical City and Asir Central Hospital. And uh, our my friend, uh, Dr. Faya al Asiri, uh, Sport and Arthroscopy Orthopedic Consultant, Head of Orthopedic. Uh, I had uh, Rafay the hospital uh, sport chapter head at uh, so in uh, Saudi Arabic Association. Dr. Faya is uh, head of one of the biggest sports uh, center, not in the uh, can say in the uh, south region. I believe one of the biggest sports center over our uh, kingdom. For uh, they are running a, a, a crazy business there. You can start, Dr. Faya. Thank you, Dr. Bangdar, uh, Dr. Mahat uh, Saati, for this uh, nice uh, organization and cooperation with uh, radiologists and orthopedic sports surgeons. Uh, I'm happy to uh, see this collaboration, and um, we wish that this is the, the start for next uh, a lot of sessions, inshallah. Um, I have uh, for my cases. Uh, I have two cases today with uh, sharing with Dr. Ali Kattani, diagnostic radiology and MSK diagnostic and interventional radiologist uh, consultant, King Faisal Medical City and Asir Central Hospital. Uh, we'll start with the first case. First case, uh, 31 year old professional play, uh, prof uh, non-professional player. Uh, uh, he's uh, athlete. Uh, he has history of twisting injury about eight months back, uh, presenting, uh, presented to my clinic about three weeks back, complaining of giving way for this all period of time and the knee pain. He has no looking and no, uh, uh, he has sometimes recurrent swelling. Uh, on examination, there is no swelling at the time of examination, uh, no scars uh, regarding a special uh, range of motion, uh, all within normal. Uh, for range of motion regarding the special test, positive plaquement test, anterior drawer test, and before shift test. Uh, he has a positive macmary test and tender joint uh, line. Uh, other special tests for other ligaments or within normal. Regarding MRI imaging, Dr. Ali will uh, start to talk about the MRI cut. I'll, uh, just pause my share. If uh, Dr. Ali, he can. Sorry. إذا ممكن بس يا دكتور فاي أساس أضيف الشيرنج حقي. إذا ممكن. Sorry, start Dr. Ali. Sorry for that. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Uh, my thanks for the organizer and for my colleague from orthopedic and uh, radiology sites. Uh, about the first case, uh, unfortunately, there is no preoperative pre uh, X-ray for the patient available at time of uh, presentation. So this is the routine protocol. Uh, usually you use it uh, for routine uh, knee MRI. Unfortunately, this is a study done uh, outside uh, my institution and uh, they use uh, axial T2 sequence instead of uh, BD FATSAT axial. Uh, for some uh, cases, we can uh, add additional uh, coronal oblique uh, proton density uh, fat sat for better uh, ACL uh, assessment. 
So uh, my static images uh, through the crochet ligaments, we can appreciate these, the BCL is intact, but there is a uh, disruption of the uh, ACL fibers, mainly at the proximal portion. Another views at the coronal and uh, axial views uh, demonstrate intact the BCL with the empty notch sign uh, suggestive of ACL uh, complete tear. Collateral ligaments, we can uh, see it here, the medial collateral ligament is intact along its way and the uh, lateral collateral ligament is uh, also intact. The lateral meniscus, while well, we go through the uh, images from lateral to medial side, we saw it, is it uh, like dark signal with a smooth outline, except here some uh, like uh, bright line uh, near the root of uh, uh, posterior root of lateral meniscus. So this is suggestive of uh, uh, longit uh, vertical longitudinal tear. Uh, and uh, similar like uh, respiratory uh, tear. And this is the images through the uh, axial approach. Uh, unfortunately, the, the suboptimal sequence, we cannot approach the uh, posterior road tear. The medial meniscus also was smooth, clear, no gross tear or contusion or uh, mucoid degeneration. At the uh, coronal views assessment of uh, both menisci, we can see here the uh, uh, both both menisci are intact. The posterior rotator is not clear in this view because if it's uh, if, uh, its orientation according to the coronal plan, we, it's not uh, approachable. Also, we can check the tibial femoral uh, cartilage. We can see it here clear, uh, gray, uh, gray signal. There is no disruption except here at the medial meniscus. There is some thinning and irregularity with changes involving the uh, central uh, cortex. The uh, patellar cartilage and uh, patellar collaterals. The collaterals looks fine, but limited assessment of patellar uh, cartilage at the axial view, which is the best uh, best uh, view to assess the cartilage uh, integrity. So we can approach some at the sagittal proton density sequence. We can see some heterogeneity with limited assessment. Some uh, few about the ACL injury radiologically. We see some swelling, increased signal intensity, and fiber discontinuity. Uh, also, the uh, some sometimes we see increased signal intensity without uh, fiber discontinuity, or uh, some some of fibers are intact and some are not. So that's suggestive of uh, partial tear. Uh, also, we see correlation uh, and orientation uh, according to intercondylar uh, lumen sat line. So, so, we see the orientation of ACL fibers, also the angle. Uh, also, we check for empty notch sign, as we mentioned before, for uh, proximal ACL uh, injury. Uh, primary sign of uh, ACL injury. Uh, we have some signs, I will go fast through this. We have some like a uh, gap sign uh, involving the medial aspect of lateral femoral condyle and the lateral aspect of uh, uh, mid ACL fibers, suggestive of partial tear, also footprint sign involving the distal uh, ACL uh, avulsion injury. The secondary signs, uh, involving the bone contusion and covered posterior horn of lateral meniscus, second fracture, reduced BCL angle due to buckling, positive BCL uh, uh, line sign, medial collateral or lateral collateral ligament injury, 
اند كورونا لاتر كولاتر ليجمنت ساين وي سي ات دي لاترالي سو ذا يوجوال بلين ريتوغراف فاندينج اف ات از افيلابل وي سي دي بلاتر سالكا ساين انتيرو تيبيال ترانسلوكيشن ساين سيجون فراكشر اور كويت فراكشر اولسو جونت فيوجن The common association with ACL injury, according to the mechanism of injury and uh, uh, conjoint association, it's including unhappy triad sequence fracture, glossoromedial corner injury, and meniscocapsular separation. This is the end of the first case. Thank you. Dr. Fai. دكتور فايع بيبي ار ميوت سوري Actually, uh, regarding this uh, patient, he uh, presented to me in uh, uh, a private sector. He brought the MRI uh, in CD and uh, the X-rays also in CD, but we didn't reach to the uh, we couldn't reach to the uh, X-ray uh, the uh, time of uh, preparing for this presentation. Uh, what I did for this patient, I did the diagnostic arthroscopy, and uh, uh, what I found, uh, I didn't. They expect to find this, but uh, what uh, explained to me uh, what happened is uh, this patient is uh, eight months back injury and presented uh, to me uh, within uh, maybe three weeks or one uh, one month. But uh, he was continuing playing football uh, uh, with the ACL uh, tear. Um, I did diagnostic arthroscopy. I found uh, posterior. Uh, Uh, posterior root uh, avulsion of the lateral meniscus, as you see, with uh, some changes at the posterior horn lateral meniscus, with uh, some uh, grade of healing in the um, in the meniscus itself, uh, body, as you see, as you see here. Uh, we are checking for the see in this in the superior surface of the uh, of the meniscus. There is some changes there. We did some debridement for it. So the second things I found during diagnos uh, arthroscopic diagnostic uh, uh, arthroscopic uh, diagnosis, I found ACL tear, as you see here, what uh, the same with what, what Ali mentioned in his uh, uh, talk. Uh, regard, uh, and I found also a small medial femoral uh, condyle os osteochondral lesion. Uh, about uh, I'm measuring it here about. So I start uh, doing. I start doing uh, micro fracture, but with the drill, drilling it. Uh, I didn't find that time uh, micro fracture uh, uh, system. So drilling is a good option to do. Uh, other option to do uh, during um, uh, micro fracturing. I uh, uh, I tried to do uh, start by planning to do two, but uh, finally I found myself I have to do the third one. Yeah, because uh, after uh, cleaning the calcified cartilage, I found this uh, little bit bigger than what expected. <clears throat> Uh, returning back to the lateral uh, meniscus by posterior root avulsion, I, uh, I plan to do uh, uh, transosseous fixation using uh, TBL guide uh, for uh, for the uh, for the posterior horn lateral posterior root. Uh, we drill with 2.4 drill, uh, and as you see here, and then uh, 4.5 drill. 
and after that we use uh, scorpion needles uh, just to pass uh, double stitch uh, using fiber wire or ortho, ortho cord in the posterior root as you see here uh, then uh, i pass the first one now uh, and then i'll i pass two after that um, i uh, pass uh, the beast pen uh, back in the interosseous uh, in the in the transosseous uh, tunnel for the uh, passing one of the stitch to do uh, bridge uh, bony bridge uh, suturing uh, as you see here uh, passing the suture shuttling the suture um, one uh, the, the the lateral one i pass it me uh, laterally the medial one i pass it through the tibial uh, tunnel and then uh, tightening the, uh, after that, preparing the tunnels of the ACL, I'll, uh, I, I, I will not talk about it, but I did it. Uh, and I passed the posterior route and I, I, uh, I fixed it uh, uh, by bony bridge and it is a stable uh, returning back to its place. And uh, clicking it now, and after that, checking the ACL graft with 8.5 grafts, as you see here, and uh, uh, that's it. Uh, regarding the arthroscopic uh, incidence, it's common to find lateral meniscal root avulsion in arthroscopic uh, uh, during arthroscopic ACL uh, reconstruction, usually with a chronic uh, ACL. So you have uh, to uh, take it in your mind and try to manage it. Uh, repairing of the lateral meniscus root, uh, posterior root with the anterior cruciate ligament will increase the stability of the uh, knee. Thank you. For second case, uh, we'll start. Uh, Second case, uh, it's about a 40 year old male complaining of knee pain for one year with uh, on and off swelling increased with running and kneeling, no giving way, no uh, no looking uh, injury. He has twisted injury about one year back. Uh, on examination, he has mild diffusion, tender joint line laterally, stable clinically with full range of motion. Now, Dr. Ali will talk about the, the radiology issue. Dr. Ali, are you there? Okay. Uh, regarding the second case, this is the preoperative planning, which is uh, normally no gross uh, injury is seen. Uh, no gross fracture, uh, normal alignment, preserved joint space, no uh, sequent fracture, uh, no overture fracture, the uh, alignment is maintained. So the same thing for the MRI protocol. The crochet ligaments appear intact uh, with the minimal increased signal intensity at the distal ACL with underlying minimal bone marrow edema likely related to myxoid changes. This is in the coronal view, the, the, uh, the same findings, but the fibers are intact. The collateral ligaments are uh, also intact. <clears throat> Going through the uh, lateral meniscus, they are uh, smooth outline with uh, dark signal intensity. There is no gross tear are seen uh, apart from mild uh, regularity near the posterior root of lateral meniscus. We can see it here, the lateral meniscus at the axial view nicely. When it's uh, done the axial plan, uh, crossing the uh, both menisci in the correct way. The medial meniscus, <coughs> it's uh, clear, uh, no gross tear or contusion. Uh, in the coronal views, we can see it again the, the same the same way. No gross tear are seen. When you go for the uh, assessment of the cartilage, we can see here at the uh, lateral uh, femoral condyle uh, two adjacent areas of. Uh, cortical depression, subcontral uh, edema, 
and some uh, unusual signal intensity involving the lateral femoral condyle cartilage. When we go back, uh, we see uh, dark signal intensity similar to the cortex posterior to the root of medial meniscus. So this is not enough for us. So we'll add, we'll check it again in the other views. So this is the uh, fragment seen at the sagittal plane. Also in the sagittal plane, this is the uh, wide uh, two adjacent areas of uh, cartilage defect with probal here, the native origin of the uh, osseous fragment. Also, we can see it here in the axial plan, two adjacent areas, one small and one bigger uh, posteriorly. Uh, all of the findings are suggestive of uh, osteochondral lesion, we, and the fragment is displaced. We can see it here, posterior to the uh, uh, posterior root of medial meniscus. Also, we have to check the whole cartilage, so the, the dependent portion is not enough for us. So according to the uh, position of the patient during the trauma or micro repetitive trauma, uh, we uh, uh, expecting different location of osteochondral region. We have to check all through the cartilage, posterior and anteriorly, and to also use the T1 signal intensity to assist the bone marrow edema. For patellar cartilage and collateral ligaments, we see it here where there is like a thinning of the uh, patellar articular uh, cartilage with heterogeneous signal intensity, but no full thickness there and no subcondral edema. So, uh, osteochondritis dissecans or osteochondral defect or osteochondral lesion is a septic separation of osteochondral fragment. And often uh, usually associated with interarticular loose body and the majority between the 10th and 14th uh, years uh, age of, uh, uh, of the age and the male predominance uh, uh, ratio of uh, two to one. The most common cause is uh, trauma. The other uh, causes, including osteonecrosis, fat emboli, repetitive microtrauma, and familial uh, dysplasia. So the most common locations, most commonly seen at the femoral condyles, uh, also talus, capitulum, and glenoid. Uh, according to our case, the OCD of the knee, it's having 25% uh, bilaterally. Uh, more commonly at the uh, medial condyle, 78.5%, uh, uh, like in our case, 15%, uh, especially at the inferior central portion, 13%, uh, at the patella, about 7.5%, typically uh, inferior medial, and rarely at the patellofemoral groove, and uncommon at the weight-bearing surface of the tibia. And this is the radiological staging of the osteochondral legion, uh, according to the findings on the X-ray and uh, MRI. So usually stage one, no X-ray findings, and the only MRI finding is subchondral edema. The stage two, there is uh, injury with subchondral fracture, but the important thing is there is no detachment and thin sclerotic margin. The X-ray only sometimes we, or mainly we, we can see anything, but sometimes we can see sclerotic or osteopenic area at the trauma site. Uh, the subtypes, according to the CT scan uh, or MRI, in the type A, we can see some cystic changes, and type B, we can see like uh, some partial separation at the under surface of osteochondral region. Stage three, is the, the fragment come detached, but not displaced. So still with rim sign, which is fluid signal intensity underneath the osteochondral lesion. At the X-ray finding, we see leucency between the osteochondral fragment and the native bone. Stage four, the, this fragment is displaced. 
and patient uh, developed more uh, symptoms like uh, joint fusion and synovial uh, irritation. X-ray findings, we see uh, leucency at the origin of the uh, fragment, and we might see some early osteoarthritic changes. And the stage five is uh, secondary osteoarthritis. The differential diagnosis, similar like osteochondral lesion. So the, the main category is osteochondral defect. This is, uh, this is our topic here. The similar finding is cystic changes at the osteoarthritis, a vascular necrosis, uh, including double line signs and uh, cortical depression, subchondral insufficiency fracture in the elderly patient and acute uh, osteochondral fracture. This is an example of an unstable OCD. We can see the leucency underneath the osteochondral lesion and the fluid signal intensity, which is called as a rim sign. This is uh, another osteochondral lesion without significant bone marrow edema, so likely suggestive of healed fracture uh, rather than stable uh, OCD, uh, which is uh, unlikely because of uh, very low uh, bone marrow edema. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ali, for this uh, details uh, regarding our patient. Uh, so I did the diagnostic arthroscopy for this patient. I found the loose body and I remove it. Uh, and then I check uh, for the lateral compartment and medial compartment. Regarding the medially, there was no uh, the meniscus was intact. And then I check the lateral meniscus. I find uh, some fraying and the changes and tears and the uh, posterior horn uh, involving part of the root. So some debridement was done for this and uh, then uh, I check the lateral uh, the cartilage the lateral uh, uh, femoral condyle for the, um, uh, the cartilage and I found this uh, 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 osteochondral legion uh, with uh, uh, like a door opening and it is uh, unstable and um, mobilizing affecting his uh, range of motion in uh, some uh, stage. Uh, so after that, I plan to do uh, for this patient, um, uh, I was measuring it, it was about uh, um, two, uh, two centimeters by 1.3 or 1.4 uh, width. Uh, so I plan to do a mosaicoplasty, not a microfracture for this patient. And uh, mosaicoplasty, it's uh, uh, transfer uh, autograft transfer of the of the cartilage from non weight bearing area to the weight bearing area. I started by the lateral uh, superolateral incision at superolateral uh, femoral condyle non weight bearing area medial opening because the orientation of our um, of the osteochondral lesion is directed a little bit medially, so I plan to go from the lateral, uh, from the medial to reach to the medial aspects of the lateral femoral condyle. So uh, I remo removed the calcified cartilage and I uh, refresh the edges. Then uh, after refreshing, going to the uh, to the superior lateral, to the lateral femoral condyle and weight bearing area and taking the uh, donor site uh, cartilage and transferring it for uh, uh, transferring it to the um, uh, recipient area. Then insertion insertion of the taking the recip uh, the recipient and return it back to the donor site uh, to prevent any fractures or something like that. And then uh, as as I'm doing like that, see at the end. Uh, at the end, this is uh, after mosaicoplasty by uh, from outside. I used two uh, eight millimeter uh, oats, uh, two knives, and it was for me. I think it's just, uh, enough for that. And this is the donor side. 
Uh, after that, this is bioscope, checking it. I did some microfracture in the medial parts. Uh, sometimes I'm combining microfracture with the mosaicoplasty if, if it is small uh, parts that it's involved. Uh, I found a good result with this. Uh, regarding, um, there's a study in Norway was done uh, comparing the uh, outcomes of the microfracture and mosaicoplasty uh, randomized control study. They found good outcome clinically with the uh, mosaicoplasty compared to microfracture, especially to uh, the size of two to five uh, cubic centimeters. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fai. I think Dr. Uh, Ali, it is very interesting cases with the informative, a lot of information. Now, uh, uh, <laughs> I want to, uh, the last group, sorry, Dr. Wasal, today is uh, not uh, lady first. So, Sir Dr. Anas uh, Hamdoun, consultant radiology and nuclear medicine in our hospital, King uh, Abdullah Abdul Aziz uh, University Hospital, and Dr. Wasal Hamid, uh, she's 49 killer orthopedic consultant at King Abdullah Abdul Aziz University Hospital, clinical assistant professor, Prince uh, Noura Bint Abdurrahman University. Uh, you can share your screen, Dr. Wasal. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Uh, Dr. Anas, can you share, please? Dr. Anas? Dr. Anas, can you share your presentation? Yes, I'm sharing it now. Are you seeing it now? Uh, yes, I'll take it out. Yeah, so first, uh, first, thank you everybody for inviting us. Uh, we have two cases. Uh, first one, like a very common scenario that we have at every clinic. And the second case is a very rare, interested case. So we'll start the first one. First case is for a 23 years old female, for a professional soccer player in Princess Noura University uh, team. Uh, she has a history of uh, ankle sprain six months prior to her presentation to family medicine. Uh, so her first visit was, um, uh, at that time, she was complaining of left uh, foot pain and uh, some kind of weakness. She was dispersed because she cannot go back to play like before. Um, they saw her, they did for her an x-ray and an MRI at that time. I will leave it for Dr. Anas. Okay, um, so um, the x-ray at the time of the uh, incident was uh, normal. I guess I'm showing the lateral view. Uh, the, they did also oblique view and AP view was not done. So they proceeded for uh, MRI, which showed uh, uh, thinning of the chondral uh, margin with subchondral cystic uh, changes. This is the sagittal proton density with fat sat. The same thing is seen in the coronal uh, PD with fat sat, uh, subchondral uh, cystic change with irregularity and thinning of the chondral margin. And uh, the same thing can be seen in the, uh, uh, the T1 without fat saturation. Yeah. Uh, three sounds. months later on, she came to the clinic again, to the family medicine, and they assessed her. They noticed there is a good range of motion. There is no instability, but still there is a lot of pain. So they refer her to physiotherapy and they give her a follow-up with us. So uh, next, please. So uh, her first presentation to us was like almost an eight month from the from her first visit, and at that time she she has a lot of pain, 
recurrent sprain uh, on examination. She has uh, uh, a muscle atrophy of the calf muscles. She has still the range of motion, has a good range of motion, but her uh, strength was really uh, affected. And um, she has an ankle uh, tenderness, uh, mainly in the medial side. Uh, so we decided to repeat the MRI again to compare it with the previous one. Also, an X-ray was done also, but wasn't significant for the MRI, uh, Dr. Anas. Okay. So the MRI again showed uh, the uh, subchondral cystic changes with the chondral uh, fraying and uh, significant increase of the subchondral uh, edema. Uh, otherwise, no significant uh, change. Uh, then we've done another uh, follow-up. I'll just continue with uh, Dr. Wissal. Uh, so we managed. <clears throat> sorry. So we managed to uh, to operate on her within a two months later. She underwent an ankle scope uh, with micro uh, fracture and anti-grade uh, drilling with, uh, and we use also a, like a scaffold material, uh, like a bone marrow stimulant uh, to to increase the healing of the cartilage. Um, actually, she was doing well with time. She progressively improved, but slowly. You know, as an, as a soccer player today, she has a lot of impact exercise. So we couldn't prevent her to, to go to sport. But we told her that uh, with impact exercises, the healing is going to be not that much. This is first. Second thing, she will not go to the normal uh like by the studies, she cannot go to the normal uh, performance like before, but she was like insisting she want to go back to play like before. So um, we repeated an MRI again, uh, and there was little improvement. Dr. Anna is going to show it to you later. Then after two years, uh, we kept following her up to two years. And the last visit was uh, in 2021. Uh, uh, it's almost two years and a half or three years post the, uh, the trauma. Uh, we did like an MRI for the curiosity to see what is, uh, what's happened. And uh, you're going to see it now with Dr. Anas. There is a, a, a massive improvement uh, based on the MRI images, but um, significantly not uh, improving clinically or uh, she cannot get normal like before based on her yeah. exercises. Yeah, so I am skipping the uh, the one with no significant improvement. I'm, I'm going to the post-operative one. Uh, now we can see a significant improvement of the uh, subchondral edema with some post-operative changes. The chondral margin due to the micro uh, drilling uh, is somewhat irregular. However, there is significant improvement of the subchondral uh, changes and also there is no sec secondary degenerative uh, changes despite the long history of the of the complaint. Uh, this is uh, uh, coronal with BD fat sat and we can confirm that the uh, bone marrow edema is, is quite uh, much improved. And uh, the, the previously seen ballooning of the chondral uh, margin has improved with some uh, uh, remnant of some irregularity, which is expected uh, post-operatively. Dr. Wissal? Uh, usually with the, with the sport people, we, we treated them a um, little bit different than regular pe uh, people. Uh, the question is, do we have to prevent them to go back to their sport? Do we have to ask them to, to decrease their uh, impact exercises or just we let them know the, uh, the future of their uh, joint and they can go with the risk of uh, increasing the arthritic changes? This question, I cannot answer it by myself. Most of the sports people, uh, they, I think they have the same issue, even regarding the knee or the shoulder. But uh, because of the ankles, like small uh, uh, contact service of the joint, uh, the, the, the damage is faster than the other joints. So really, I don't have the questions. Uh, if they ask me, do we have to go back or not? Usually it was like, I cannot prevent them. So um, they back with, uh, with a lot of damage later on. Okay, regarding the, um, the osteochondral uh, injury, these are just duplication of uh, the staging, which has already been covered by my colleague, uh, Dr. Ali Al-Qahtani. So I'll move uh, quickly. And uh, this is the, um, uh, the classification or grading which we use, which is uh, uh, Anderson with some uh, uh, amendment or some update by adding the stage uh, five, which is the, uh, the uh, associated degenerative uh, changes. Some people, 
they added more detailed uh, classification. I will not go through it, but I will just quickly show uh, examples for uh, grade one. Uh, and this is how it can appear with high resolution MRI. You can see the chondral uh, disruption clearly. Another case with grade 2A, uh, we can see here the lifting of the cartilage clearly. And here we can see a, a, a very thin uh, focus of uh, fracture through the cartilage. And uh, it can be as uh, uh, here in another sequence with PD fat sat, it's more clear in this. And also the defect in the cartilage is, is, is even more clear with uh, PD fat sat. Uh, here, uh, grade two B with B with more obvious uh, chondral uh, injury in two uh, uh, sequences. Um, I will just skip that by showing grade four, which uh, showing the displacement of the uh, cartilage uh, fragment. I will also skip that. Just show some authors that are using uh, uh, cone beam CT, which uh, may add some more details for the chondral. Uh, margin and the uh, fracture. For example, this is the uh, uh, MRI, BD fat sat, which is not showing uh, uh, obviously the chondral uh, fracture, but here it's, it's quite obvious after we did the, this uh, uh, contrasted study for, uh, for cone beam CT, and also we are seeing some uh, contrast entering uh, within the uh, subchondral cystic abnormality from the same uh, author uh, showing Obviously, the cone beam showed the uh, fragment uh, separation, uh, and this is the MRI. It's all sh showing the defect, but no obvious uh, um, uh, um, uh, visualization of the of the uh, fragmented uh, uh, bone as in here. I'll, uh, I'll go to the next with Dr. Wissal. Next case. Uh, just I'm going to ask you, Dr. Ernest, do you recommend to do like a CT or MRI usually in those cases, or I do have to do it both? What, what is your recommendation? Uh, I would do MRI only because we don't have the facility of cone beam uh, CT. And most of the time, um, because we are having three Tesla MRI, the resolution can be sufficient to show the, the cartilage uh, changes and the subchondral uh, the cystic degenerative changes as well. So most of Perfect. the time, MRI will do the job. Perfect. So my second case, or our second case, is uh, for a 21 years old. She has a history of ankle sprain three years prior to her presentation. And uh, she came with um, right ankle pain and swelling. Uh, and her pain is getting worse with the prolonged standing or even with long uh, walking. On her examination, uh, there was a mild gen uh, general swelling of her ankle and hind foot. There was a tenderness over the perineal tendon, but there is no tenderness over the lateral ligament. She has a full range of motion and there is significant uh, weakness all over her ankle uh, muscle. Next. So my plan at that time, I was considering CRPS at that time. I don't know why she, she must mention something regarding... Uh, a uh, sign or symptoms, so I request a bone scan to rule it out. Also, I request an MRI to assess her lateral ligament and to rule out any perineal tendon uh, pathology, tendinitis, or tear, and to rule out OCD as, as a sequel of uh, ankle sprain. But surprising that uh, you can see it now with the MRI, what we found. Okay, this is her MRI, which uh, uh, showed this... Um uh, oval shaped uh, abnormality with high signal and uh, the surrounding extensive uh, edema of the calcaneum. It's, it's even uh, not uh, proportionate to the uh, abnormality within the, uh, within the subchondral uh, region. Uh, this thing, um, uh, also the, uh, the uh, unexpected location made us reluctant uh, to, uh, to, uh, to call it osteoid osteoma from the beginning. Uh, but retrospectively, it looks uh, like it. Uh, and, and according to the other symptoms, as mentioned by Dr. Wissal, we had to do a nuclear medicine uh, scan and then confirm it with CT scan, as I will show later. But here, as we can see, this is the subchondral uh, region. It's adjacent to the subtalar uh, joint. And uh, it's the, there is this oval-shaped structure associated with some hypointensity, which may suggest uh, uh, sclerosis, although it is non-specific because uh, this is uh, MRI. 
the MRI again in the sagittal view, BD fat such, it shows extensive marrow edema. And also because it is abutting the joint, we are having uh, moderate joint effusion within the ankle joint and also uh, joint effusion involving the subtalar joint uh, as well. So um, this is uh, the um, uh, coronal view showing the same uh, abnormality, which is confirmed later on by nuclear medicine uh, to have the typical uh, hot within a hot sign. I will just show the delayed uh, image. Uh, this is uh, the hot area of the calcaneum. And this is the normal calcaneum, as you can see it here. And this is the abnormal one. Uh, there is a round area of increased uh, 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 uptake and a small focus of, of even more increased uh, uptake, which is called the uh, uh, double density, but it's not accurate. It is hot within a hot sign, uh, indicating uh, osteoid osteoma, which has been confirmed by the gold standard, which is the CT, showing uh, a lucent, a well-defined lucent subcortical uh, area associated with significant uh, sclerotic uh, margin here. Uh, these uh, features, of course, are typical of osteoid uh, osteoma, and we made confidently the diagnosis, and even we suspected that some uh, irregularity within the margin of the lesion, which might suggest uh, disruption, uh, increasing the, the symptoms of the joint effusion and the reaction within the joint uh, space itself. So uh, by now, we made confidently the, the diagnosis. And usually the diagnosis of uh, osteoid osteoma when it is intra-articular, it's usually delayed. I, I, I went through the literature and I found most of the uh, cases has been delayed in uh, diagnosis and delayed in uh, management. And our case, uh, alhamdulillah, uh, it has been diagnosed very quickly within a uh, few uh, weeks. We, we made the final uh, diagnosis. And uh, in a minute, uh, Dr. Wissal is going to talk to you about the uh, management of uh, this uh, uh, patient. I'll just skip uh, these to show you uh, why uh, people tend to misdiagnose or to delay the diagnosis of such uh, cases, uh, because usually it is a typical location in terms of sight, in terms of being intra-articular, uh, also in terms of being subchondral, which might, might mimic uh, geode, which might mi mimic um, other, other causes of osteonecrosis or any uh, subchondral cystic changes, or even some, some people, the, it has been uh, diagnosed, misdiagnosed by uh, as having arthritis or, or infection. And the diagnosis was delayed for even uh, uh, up to 20 months in some uh, cases in other uh, joints. And, and also, of course, it, in, in the trauma setting, it also it mimics uh, contusion. Uh, Dr. Rosal? Uh, can you back, Dr. Anas, to one of the coronal view? in MRI or CT. So uh, because of the size of the osteoid osteoma on regard of the subtalar joint, it was affecting a good uh, surface of the joint. If I decided to go with a resection of the osteoid osteoma, that uh, in this case, that means I will go for sub subtalar fusion because I'm affecting a, main, uh, a major uh, part of the weight-bearing uh, surface of that joint. So... Um, I discussed it with one of my colleagues in QTH, um, an oncology and orthopedic, and he said, okay, let's give it a trial with um, uh, uh, radiofrequent ablation. There's no much study con discussing those uh, kind of uh, lesion on this uh, uh, joint, but we will give it a trial. So uh, I refer the patient to him, and I keep following the case uh, with him. He mentioned there is a, a main uh, or a big uh, different regarding the pain and uh, and the swelling, and uh, you know there's uh, by by the images it's taking time for the osteoidosteoma to heal, but there is a significant improvement. So uh, by by treating them with a like a minimal um, uh, invasive treatment, we we try to preserve our joint rather than going with um, resection and uh, and fusion, which is more aggressive, I think, in this uh, scenario. So alhamdulillah, we, uh, we, uh, we get the diagnosis too fast and, um, and the collaboration with other hospitals, they help um, on, uh, on uh, improving uh, our patient uh, life. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to ask uh, our uh, radiologist friend regarding this OCD in the knee, like Dr. Faya present and uh, in the ankle. Uh, 
if I, I need a, as a surgeon, I need more uh, details about the, uh, the the depth, the size. Uh, do I need to request a CT scan or specific uh, images, contrast or something to have or MRI? It's, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a good to give me um, a clear or uh, detailed information about the OCD size. Um, we usually for such uh, patients, we tend to do them in our three Tesla MR. And most of the time, it's quite sufficient in terms of showing the degree of cartilage uh, injury. And we can quantify uh, confidently the size and the depth of, of these uh, lesions. Uh, but uh, some people, they are showing, as I showed in my presentation, um, uh, when you do a contrast, when you do arthroscopy, uh, arthrography, uh, you add it to comb beam, which is a high resolution uh, CT, just like that one used in dentistry. It tends to 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 have more clarification of the, of the abnormality. However, this is not used uh, uh, in 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 many uh, hospitals. Most of the people they tend to uh, do just a high resolution MRI using uh, cartilage sensitive uh, uh, sequences. My my other colleagues can add. I uh, agree with you, Doctor. Uh, um, if you do three Tesla uh, MRI for the joint and proton density sequences, and also uh, from my experience, if you add um, gradient coronal, uh, uh, it will be uh, helpful. And also, you need to see the fluid signal uh, beneath the uh, the OCD, and uh, if there is any minimal displacement. Um, all the cases I saw before and reported, uh, I think no need for uh, for the uh, CT scan, uh, 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 sorry, uh, arthrogram CT scan. It should be straightforward, inshallah. Uh, Dr. Sagar, you want to say something? Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm just... Uh... Uh, I want to take this, this uh, advantage to ask our colleague in the MSK radiologist. Uh, so when, when, when is the best time to request an MRI for a query patient with ACA? Is it in the first two weeks, after six weeks? What's your, what's your opinion on this? Let's say we are the one who requests the MRI, but what's the best time that you can read the MRI accurately? Is it in acute position? Is it late? Is it is there any time frame for this? Um, yeah. Yeah, um, actually, it's it's a it's a tough question. It's it's very hard to answer. But uh, my answer is there is no time. Um, MRI um, should be sensitive for for injury in in all times. However. Um, early in the injury, sometimes the, the degree of, of uh, edema uh, can uh, affect the visibility. But now with, with improvement of the resolution and with doing um, uh, um, uh, high resolution cuts uh, and we do doing oblique uh, views for the dedicated the SEL uh, clarification, we, we should be able to see the the injury at, at, at any time and uh, characterize it uh, well. But usually um, uh, in, in the acute setting, sometimes it might be not very accurate and we tend to, to give uh, some sort of uh, um, things like uh, moderate or uh, uh, edema or uh, the, 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 the phrasing which, 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 which we tend to use it when we are not uh, sure that there is obvious disruption of the, of the, of the fibers thank you uh, another question so doctor قبل ما ننتقل للسؤال الثاني from my experience i never do it uh, before two weeks في حاله اذا كان البيشنت uh, يعني مستعجلين عليه مثلا عنده tendon injury you want to hurry and uh, fix it sometimes they, they don't wait and they can do it uh, after the surgery الستاندرد uh, uh, حقنا اعتقد في الـ في, الـ في الموضوع هذا انه الاديمه تو بي سبسايد حتى وان كانت الكواليتي تحسنت 
uh, I will not create any chance to uh, uh, mistake or uh, mislead the uh, the orthopedics about the uh, correct finding. Uh, so, uh, يعني, uh, never, uh, يعني, or at least uh, not before two weeks, as uh, as much as the uh, subedema, the, the edema is uh, subside, so we can proceed to do uh, uh, MRI with con- uh, uh, routine MRI because I want to differentiate between the uh, expected post traumatic contusion. So edema of the adjacent soft tissue, there, is, there, there, there will be no contrast between the like ligament uh, injury and edema and the adjacent soft tissue edema. Not all the cases are uh, easy to read. So I will not create the, uh, the chance for, uh, for uh, mistaken such uh, finding. Uh, uh, unless there is agreement between the radiologist and the orthopedic surgeon. Thank you. Totally agree with you. We are seeing patients with contused ACL. Okay. And on examination, they are stable. Sometimes in acute setting, yes, you are right. Totally, totally. This is the stress point that I want to show. Some patients, they have um, uh, access to radiology um, uh, acutely. So they can do the MRI uh, acutely. They came to the clinic after a week or two. We examine them, they are stable. The MRI is showing completely um, uh, edematous uh, and high signal intensity in, in the ACL, but examination showed um, uh, uh, stable ACL. Thank you. Another question, as Dr. Faya showed, it's very difficult for me to see the root of the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus. We are seeing it as uh, uh, sports guys, we are seeing it frequently for chronic ACL. In MRI, they, they didn't mention anything. Even for me, once I go back after the surgery, after repairing the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus, once I go back, I cannot, I cannot see anything. It's in, the, in its place, and the meniscus femoral is still attached, and it's pulling the, the, the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus in place. So is there any secondary sign that we can know during the, the, uh, the cuts that the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus might be injured? Secondary sign like extrusion, something like that. Because in, 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 in lateral meniscus, the meniscus femoral is still attached. So the patient doing MRI in, in, in flex position, in seating position, so most likely the root will be there. So what do you think? I think for, for, uh, for the decision of, of assessing the, the menisci, um, what we usually tend to do to avoid uh, over or under diagnosis is to uh, correlate the three uh, planes together, not to read one uh, cut without looking at the other. And usually what we do, we do cross-referencing for the three uh, planes, the sagittal, the axial, and the coronal. And also, uh, if the axial is not done properly, it will not show you the injury uh, nicely, especially for the root uh, injury. If you do very good axial cuts, uh, for example, thin cuts through the axial uh, uh, plane properly through the menisci, bec- uh, you will be able to see the injury also in the axial cuts. But in the coronal and sagittal, uh, w- when you, you see an injury, you should correlate it. You should cross-reference. And then if you do it this way, you will not miss uh, the the injury, but it is very much technique depend, dependent. I agree with you. In most of the time, um, we tend to over diagnose or under diagnose if the technique is done not done properly or if our experience is not uh, uh, sufficient in that uh, context. اتفق مع الدكتور هذه تعتمد أكثر شيء على التكنيك المستخدم والبلانينج. Is it correct or not? الشيء الثاني هل السيكونس هي السيكونس المطلوبة أو لا أنا ذكرت في البرزنتيشن حقي إنه فيه واحدة من السيكونس بدلوها بواحدة ثانية وطلعت تقريبا يوزلس و didn't confirm any other finding I see it in the other planes فتعتمد هل البروتوكول متسوي صح هل نعتمد على البلانينج هل هو صح إذا كنت في مكان كثير فيه الاشكاليات هذه 
اعتقد انه يو هاف تو ريلي مور ان انتروبراتيف فايندينج مور ذان ام ار اي فايندينج لان هذه ليميتيشن احيانا الواحد ما يقدر يتحكم فيها شكرا اوكي اي ثينك از تايم اكتب عندي تسمح لي بس اجاوب على واحد من الاسئله اي ثينك از ا جود كويستشن Uh, by Dr. Nabil Al-Ghamdi, uh, he asks, actually this can be for all the sports uh, doctor around, he asks, if, um, is there any important for physician to include objective uh, outcomes for functional or activity level of patient pre- and post-intervention and how that can affect our decision uh, for, uh, for going with operative or non-operative? Uh, so I think it's yes, we, we consider those uh, uh, activities at the level of uh, if the patient is a professional uh, player, non-professional, usually we try with a conservative treatment for, uh, for most of the cases, especially in, in, in foot and ankle. I try usually with, with give it a trial with uh, physiotherapy, analgesia, icing. Some of them, they, they do improve uh, uh, without even uh, seeking any surgical intervention. But for athletic people, I think the story is totally different because we are affecting their, um, uh, some of them, like, and not in Saudi, if, if they are outside, we are affecting like a career for them. Uh, I think they, 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 we go more to more aggressive for surgical intervention just to come so they can go back uh, uh, to sport as fast as they can. Uh, is it the same for for the knee, Dr. Bender, and the rest? Yes, I think this the aim of this webinar not about what the indication of surgery or what the as is this right I show a technique. It's, uh, it's how I want every group sharing the, their experience how to communicate with his colleague radiologist or the radiologist communicate with the surgeon if they have any concern and to everyone have a special way. Maybe Doctor Sagar way is better. Doctor Muad or Wasal. Uh, this is the aim of this uh, webinar and for for sure the share the house. The finding correlate with the interrupt it will be interesting for our colleague uh, radiologist to see it. Uh, how is the images are they finding uh, um, uh, affecting our plan and interrupt uh, decision? So uh, I would like to thank the, all our audience. It's a good number. I am uh, happy and I'm sorry for the late and uh, actually and I would uh, thank the Ortho TV. Um, uh, for the course stream because this number just for our audience I don't know how much the uh, our, for for the uh, the course stream uh, special thanks to the uh, our uh, team in the uh, the IT those the soldiers that we didn't know Dr. Saud Al Ali Dr. Ma Abdul Rahim Dr. Abrar Safta and uh, I'm so sorry if uh, by mistake I forgot any names and. Uh, for audience, please don't forget to register for the semi hours. And uh, special uh, thanks, Dr. Um, uh, Mad Saati, Dr. Mohammed Salman, uh, for coordinate uh, this. And uh, Dr. Uh, Salman, talk. Uh, yeah, wait for your talk, please. Salam alaikum. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a good start. I think uh, it is a, a unique experience that we had a uh, different joint, different experience in different areas. So I think uh, it is uh, great having the group together and we are looking forward for the next webinar. Uh, I think uh, we're going to have more fun in the next webinar. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Dr. Uh, Maid. Uh, now, uh, can you uh, close the webinar, please? I really appreciate what you have done, Dr. Bender. It's a great start as everybody is available. My, all my colleagues, my old friend that we don't see each other for a very long time. It's a nice gathering that we've done. And it is something that has to be continued more and more frequently. Hopefully, inshallah, in the coming soon, it will be more interactive, more audience. But as a start, as Dr. Bender was mentioning, it's great. We had around 100 plus uh, candidates with us. Um, thank you one more time. And by my name and by the name of Dr. Bender as well, and Princess Noura University and King Abdullah bin Abdulaziz University Hospital, we are glad to join you all anytime. 
next time, inshallah ta'ala, hopefully it's going to be live surgery or a live uh, meeting. And, um, and we would like to welcome you all very soon, inshallah, to our next meeting, the knee conference meeting, which is going to be part uh, 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 We are working on it with Dr. Bandar, and we'll announce it very soon, maybe in, next, in our next webinar. Have a very good night, everybody. And Dr. Anas, uh, you have, uh, I, I like your brevness and see your uh, clear, but our lack of resources and uh, our CEO is attending this webinar. But I'm assuring you, uh, our joint resolution program will make our centers pioneer advance in uh, how we can manage anything related to the joint. Thank Dr. you. Dr. Bender, I was trying to bypass that, but as long as you mention it, we're going to work on it as well to have it made in Allah. Inshallah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.